near the turn of the 20th century, African Americans with means began participating in what is known as the Land Run of 1893, leading to the establishment of 50 all-black towns and settlements in the state of Oklahoma, which was among the highest of any state or territory at that time. Successful businessman O.W. Gurley eventually landed in an area north of Tulsa where he purchased 40 acres, which he then sectioned off and sold exclusively to other African Americans. Many other well-off blacks followed suit, taking up property, building homes and businesses, and fostering a sense of community among its flourishing residents. Their efforts would inevitably create the Greenwood District. By the 1910s, this area was well on its way to containing one of the highest concentrations of African Americans in the country at that time. Within its bounds were schools, churches, homes, grocery stores, banks, libraries, all of which were owned, operated, and patronized by blacks. Among its citizens were attorneys, real estate agents, entrepreneurs, doctors, and other professionals who offered their services in the neighborhood. This plot of just over 60 acres, nestled in what would go on to be the second largest city in the state, stood as the impetus of so-called progression for America as a whole, and its demonstrably disenfranchised citizens in particular. This is especially significant when considering that this thriving village was located in a state that was part of the last of the Confederate holdouts at a time when black people were just over a half century removed from being officially declared emancipated and when the nation was still embroiled within the constraints of Jim Crow laws. Thus, to say this was a monumental feat for African Americans would be an understatement. And although this area would come to horrifically meet a tragic end, its legacy, despite the implicit attempts at erasure from the annals of history, would be impressed upon the hearts and minds of generations to come, many of whom were inspired enough to try and replicate the wonder that was affectionately known as Black Wall Street. One such person was Floyd McKissick. Born nearly a year after the destruction in Tulsa, from an area three states to the east, McKissick was an African-American lawyer and civil rights activist. His participation in fighting for the justice of his people began as early as the age of 12 with his NAACP membership. McKissick graduated from high school in 1939 and in 1940 went to Atlanta to attend Morehouse College. After enrolling, McKissick joined the U.S. Army, and during World War II, he served in the European theater as a sergeant. In 1947, he returned to Morehouse to finish his undergrad, crossing paths with one who would go on to be another civil rights activist of note. Deciding to pursue a career in law, McKissick returned to his native state, where he applied to the University of North Carolina School of Law and was subsequently denied admission based on his race. After his denial, he enrolled in North Carolina College School of Law, now North Carolina Central University, which was the school for blacks at that time. While in NCC's law school, the NAACP accepted McKissick's case and filed a lawsuit against UNC. Thurgood Marshall led their defense. In 1951, a ruling by the United States Court of Appeals allowed McKissick and three other students admission to UNC. At the time of the ruling, McKissick had nearly finished his law degree from NCC, but he took courses at UNC during the summer of 1957, making him among the first group of black students to be admitted. In 1955, McKissick established a law firm in Durham. His firm was involved with civil rights issues and his clients included the first black undergraduates to attend UNC Chapel Hill in that same year. McKissick would replace James Farmer as head of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, on January 3, 1966, giving the organization a 
180 degree turn that saw it change from an interracial integrationist civil rights agency pledged to uphold nonviolence into a militant and uncompromising advocate of the ideology of black power. McKissick's tenure with the organization would be dominated by his controversial stance, with the media quick to focus on his particular area of disagreement between he and fellow civil rights advocate Martin Luther King Jr., who held an unwavering stance of nonviolent activism. Despite this, the two leaders sought to downplay their differences, stressing their brotherhood and areas of mutual respect and agreement. In fact, areas where their ideologies converged was when opposing the Vietnam War and appearing together in support of black athletes boycotting the 1968 Olympics. Not long after the assassination of his contemporary on April 4th of that year, McKissick would resign from CORE in an attempt to find his own way to empower his people. Shortly before his death, King noted that it was useless for any black person to be allowed to eat in a restaurant if he or she could not afford to settle the check. After the 1968 Civil Rights Bill was passed, many activists focused on the economic development in black communities so African Americans could take advantage of the resources they recently won. McKissick, among the first to do so, created McKissick Enterprises to invest in black businesses, focusing on the development of black economic power. An interest in real estate would further bring to fruition an idea he had been germinating for the better part of his life, first spoken into existence when he observed the United States provide aid to Western Europe after World War II under the Marshall Plan an American initiative enacted in 1948 to provide foreign aid to Western Europe. The United States transferred over $13 billion in economic recovery programs to Western European economies after the end of World War II. If the government helped allies in rebuilding their land, certainly they would help their own citizens do the same. Today in America, 90% of our people live and work on 2% of our land. Our cities are becoming inhumane. Our rural areas depressed. We have 3,500 acres of beautiful land with more than 400 acres set aside for industrial development. An initial 100-acre track has been fully developed. The terrain is level and soils are well-drained with a sanded to clay loam surface over firm red clay. At Seoul City, people of all ages, races, and religions can work together, play together, and learn together. Seoul City, a fresh start. Manson was an unincorporated community of farmland located in the northeastern parts of North Carolina, just along the nation's first north to south major highway, US-1. That way to empower his people, McKissick believed, would come through those 5,000 acres in Warren County. McKissick purposefully chose this specific area as it was one of the poorest in the state with an average median income of $1,300 from the low-income agriculture jobs. 60% of the population was African-American. The school systems were very impoverished, with about 40% of adults without a high school education. The county also lacked adequate health care services, sharing just a dozen general practitioners with the neighboring county. That's 12 doctors for a combined 48,000 people. In fact, once McKissick started construction, the first request by citizens was the development of a healthcare facility. Despite there being an idealistic move to develop at that location, there was also a pragmatic element 
as the site was near an interstate highway and a major railroad, thus making it an alluring mid-Atlantic hub for other industries. Around 1969, McKissick began pitching the idea of Soul City to investors and lawmakers. Planned to contain three villages housing 18,000 people in just a few decades. By 2004, a projected 44,000 with 24,000 jobs to stimulate the economy. With funding, McKissick would build up the infrastructure to support the city with jobs, education, housing, training, and other social services on a site that was essentially economically future-proofed. Though the emphasis was placed on providing opportunities for minorities and the poor, Seoul City was a town intended for all. Through McKissick's savvy presentation, it had gained enough attraction to be one of the 13 model city projects under the Urban Growth and New Community Development Act of 1970. In 1972, the city received a grant of $14 million from HUD, a loan of $500,000 from the First Pennsylvania Bank, $1.7 million from the state of North Carolina, and another million from private donors. In all, McKissick would secure more than $19 million in federal funds, with an additional $8 million from state and local sources. By 1974, pioneering families moved to Seoul City, and steady progress was apparent in the laying of water and sewer lines, construction of roads, a daycare, a health care center, and a 52,000 square foot steel and glass facility named Soul Tech One. The development of Seoul City wasn't without its problems, and its inevitable decline was caused by a number of factors. McKissick first caused a stir when he, at the time a Democrat, switched to the Republican Party and later became a minority campaign chairman for President Richard Nixon's re-election. Much like King, McKissick believed the way to uplift African Americans at that time was through black capitalism, stating that unless the black man attains economic independence, any political independence will be an illusion. Nixon supported black capitalism and McKissick backed Nixon, which is essentially how he was able to secure the bulk of the city's startup money then there was Jesse Helms, who was an outspoken opponent to the development of the city. Helms was also a former Democrat, but won his senator seat for North Carolina as a Republican. Despite the party change, he still kept many of his conservative Democratic views. In 1975, Seoul City came under attack by Helms and Democratic Representative L. H. Fountain, who successfully pushed for an audit of the city's accounts, as Helms saw the entire project as a misappropriation of federal funds. McKissick would admit that the development of Seoul City had political implications, but denied any impropriety. As noted, with over 40% of Warren County's population not even high school educated, combined with the shortage of skilled laborers and lack of industrial experience, this deterred some industries from moving to Seoul City, causing the local economy to stagnate. Add to that, the U.S. economy had one of the worst stock market downturns since the Great Depression, as inflation hit double digits in 1973 and 1974. For the rest of the decade, the country went through stagflation, the simultaneous burden of inflation and employment stagnation. Some argue that Seoul City, as well as other new town programs, would have succeeded if there was not an economic recession. The negative press coverage of the city deterred not just industries, but also white homeowners. The press covered Seoul City as a new black town, which made it unappealing for white residents to move in. The Wall Street Journal, which had significant credence in the business community, 
portrayed McKissick in a negative manner as a lavish living lawyer. This damaged McKissick's name and identity, which negatively impacted his efforts in bringing in new industry. By 1979, the city failed to reach its initial ambitions. Lawsuits and investigations into the use of funds by the Seoul City Company, the city's developers, resulted in foreclosure, despite being cleared by the Government Accountability Office audit. In June of that year, HUD decided to pull its funding for Seoul City, declaring it economically unviable. In the following year, the Seoul City Corporation and the federal government reached an agreement. Under the terms, HUD planned to pay off $10 million in loans and agreed to pay an additional $175,000 of the project's debts. In exchange, McKissick agreed to drop a lawsuit brought to block HUD from shutting down the project. His company also retained 88 acres, including the site of a mobile home park and the Seoul Tech One building, the latter of which was eventually purchased by the adjoining Warren County Correctional Institution for expansion, effectively turning it into a prison. Seoul City may not have reached the ambitions McKissick had planned for. However, there are still some positive outcomes to this project. Seoul City brought the first healthcare facility to the residents of Warren County and a three county water system and sewage disposal system. After Seoul City was created, more African Americans moved to North Carolina than out in the 1970s, and this was the first time since the Reconstruction era. In 1980, 35 housing units, a clinic, a tennis court, and a pool had been developed. About 150 people were employed in the city. In 1990, Floyd McKissick was appointed a state district court judgeship in the 9th Judicial District in North Carolina by Republican Governor James G. Martin on Sunday, April 28, 1991, less than a year after being appointed, while also working as a pastor of the First Baptist Church of Seoul City. McKissick died of lung cancer at the age of 69. He was buried in the very place he founded. We're building a town called Soul City in North Carolina. A town that's going to afford black people job opportunities, 20 such jobs as one, center plan, as one city planner has indicated that never have been available to black people before. And these 20 areas of job classification have never been open to them in the north or in the south. A concrete obelisk stands at the entrance of this unrealized utopia, serving as an unofficial memorial to a planned community dream that had ultimately failed. Unlike the violent and abrupt ending to Black Wall Street, the death of Seoul City appeared to be one of a thousand cuts. Whether that was from the swipes taken by assumed political allies, jabs taken by the media, the inundating bureaucracy inherent with government agencies, or the crushing and ongoing litigation. Despite this, McKissick's ambition should be celebrated and legacy seen as one not of failure, but yet another example of a tree's unwavering inclination to rise up despite the ground into which it was planted. <laughs>